Hey guys, welcome to Anatomy and Physiology. My name is Matthew Belzer, and if you're watching this video, this is lecture one in my class. So you probably had an orientation of some kind in an orientation video, and some of this may be a bit redundant in the very beginning, but I do want to highlight what you should do at the beginning of every one of my lectures. So each lecture is going to have a set of learning objectives associated with it, and it's also going to have what's called a handout. So if you're in my class, you can actually go into Blackboard and you can download the handout and either print it out or you can have it up on your computer and you can type your notes in. And the way the handouts look is kind of like this. So every lecture I give is going to come with a corresponding handout. And the handouts are either going to go by slides, meaning the lecture is going to go by slides, and I'm going to say slide one, slide two, slide three, slide four, and five, and you're going to answer the corresponding questions or you're going to have follow-alongs. So this is just to help guide your thinking as to what are the important takeaway points with every lecture that I'm giving. So some of the follow-alongs are fill in the blanks. Some of them are multiple choice questions that uh, kind of evaluate your understanding of the content that we've just been over. Some of them are short answer questions in which you have to write in a response. Some of them are just take notes. But it helps you to kind of track along. So if you get to follow along two, you can go back and go, okay, what was the important points in follow along one? Slides are a little bit different, but it's the same fundamental thing. So every lecture that I give is going to come with a corresponding handout. First thing I would do if you're taking my class and you're trying to follow along or track with one of my lectures is I would either print that handout out and put it in a notebook and organize it so you have a nice consolidated space for your studying for exams or I would have a computer up or a tablet or whatever you take notes on so you can take notes on that handout as we go through because I emphasize the important points on that handout. Now, today we're going to be starting with an overview of what anatomy and physiology is before looking at levels of organization. So it's a relatively short lecture comparative to some of the others. It's part of the chapter one lecture block. This is the first lecture content lecture you have in the course. Now, if you'll notice at the top, I've put follow along one definitions of anatomy and physiology. So now you can start kind of tracking along with where you should be taking notes. And I'll kind of point that out. I'll say follow along two, follow along three. So you are taking anatomy and physiology with me. And in order to understand anatomy and physiology, it's important to first define what those topics are. So anatomy is the study of body structure, right? So we have tons of different structures that we're going to be going over, and in very general terms, and very broad terms, anatomy is the study of structure, while physiology, on the other hand, is the study of function. And anatomy and physiology are very closely related because structure always determines function. In other words, anatomy determines physiology. So when we look at this eye over here, we see that the eye is made up of a series of structures. Some of those structures are things like the transparent lens and the anterior aspect of the eye called the cornea. Then we have the internal lens, just referred to as the lens. And the job of the cornea and the lens is to focus light on the retina. So what I've just talked about there are structure function relationships. And one of the questions that I often ask on the exam is, can you give me your own structure function relationship? You can think about the joints in your body or your hair or your nostrils, whatever it is. What are the structures and what functions do they serve? Because anatomy is the study of structure, while physiology is the study of function. So you have the cornea and lens, which are structures, and then the function is to focus light onto the retina of the eye, which is where the processes of what's, what's called visual transduction take place. So think about your own structure function relationships. And structure function relationships hold true not just at the level that we can see with the unaided eye or even under the microscope. They hold true all the way down to the molecular level. So what we're looking at on this image is a little protein, a functional protein called an enzyme. Now, if you're trying to think about the spatial scale of the enzyme, like how big is it? In every cell, so if I was an enzyme and I was standing next to, let's say, a cell lining the small intestines, that cell would be like 10 Empire State Buildings tall and 10 Empire State Buildings wide, and there would be millions of me in it. Enzymes are molecules that are much smaller than cells. They're these little functional proteins that are much smaller than cells. 
right? So when people talk about molecular biology, molecular biology is just a study of things that are really, really, really small. But the same relationship holds true. Structure determines function. So if you look at the structure of this enzyme, right, this enzyme's a digestive enzyme. It's like a little pair of chemical scissors, and it binds to this thing called its substrate, right, which is another molecule, and it stresses the bonds, right, that are holding these two components of that molecule together, and it breaks them. Now, the only reason that the enzyme can do that is because of its three-dimensional shape or its structure, Structure always determines function. If I change the three-dimensional shape of that enzyme, I will change its function or its ability to do anything. So structure determines function. Anatomy determines physiology at every spatial scale, from the large things to the very small things. Now, when you think about anatomy and physiology, those are just kind of blanket terms. And each discipline is broken into a series of subdivisions. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the subdivisions of anatomy, the subdivisions of physiology, and then what I've given you with the follow-alongs, because now we're on the next follow-along, is how do questions that probe your understanding of the different subdivisions, how can they potentially be presented on something like an exam? So when we think about anatomy, it's a study of structure, and it can be broken into different subdivisions. So macroscopic or gross anatomy, when I use terms like macroscopic or gross, it doesn't mean like gross ooh, right? It's talking about structures that you can see with the unaided eye. On the other hand, microscopic anatomy is talking about structures that are too small to be seen with the unaided eye, so we need a microscope to study them. And those are our two major subdivisions. Macroscopic anatomy can be broken into systemic, regional, and surface anatomy, which we'll go over kind of one by one. And then microscopic anatomy can be broken into cytology, the study of cells, and histology, the study of tissues. You also have other fields or subdivisions of anatomy, like developmental anatomy, pathological anatomy, radiographic anatomy, and we're just going to kind of go through each one of those one by one, and we're going to spend more time on anatomy today than we are on physiology. We'll definitely tread into the physiology uh, very heavily later on. Now, when you think about subdivisions of physiology, physiology can be broken into general physiology, which is the study of normal function, and pathophysiology, which is the study of abnormal function, which can indicate disease. So why would you want to know normal function? Well, if you know what things are supposed to function like or how things are supposed to function, right, you can start to identify when things aren't functioning properly. And that's the study of pathophysiology, right? When you identify deviations from the norm, you go, oh, that's abnormal. And that's indicative of disease. So... When you think about physiology, physiology is the science of life. It's a very broad field of study, right? You can go to a, a physiology center, like a, a physiology um, a, a department dedicated to the study of physiology, and you can have one person studying uh, atoms and molecules, the chemistry of some metabolic process, while another person might be looking at bone density in response to exercise, while another person may be looking at how medications influence different organ systems. It's a really, really broad study. So it's a large field, but in general, it's the study of function. Physiology is the study of normal function. Pathophysiology looks at deviations from the norm that may be indicative of disease. And you study this, we're studying the physiology now, you're definitely going to get pathophys later on down the road. So let's look at our subdivisions of anatomy a little bit more carefully. And we're still on follow along too, so I'm not expecting you to answer all those multiple choice questions quite yet, but they give you an idea of the way that questions could come on something like a formal assessment, like an exam or a quiz. So there are two major subdivisions of anatomy, macroscopic or gross anatomy, or just structures that can be seen with the unaided eye, whereas microscopic anatomy is structures that you need a device to assist you or help you to see, right, like a microscope. So those are our two major subdivisions. Here we're looking at the heart and we're looking at the macroscopic or the gross anatomical features of the heart like the aorta and the apex and the left ventricle. And here we're looking at cardiac muscle tissue under the microscope. Each one gives you important details about those structures. It's not that one is more important than the other. And in fact, we study both in this class.
Now, when you think about subdivisions of macroscopic anatomy, they can be approached in a variety of ways. So we have systemic, regional, and surface anatomy. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at everything that we go over in this class and define those different subdivisions of anatomy as we go through them. So systemic anatomy studies how structures work together to accomplish specific sets of functions. So when you talk about the digestive system and you're looking at the anatomy of the digestive system, you go, okay, you have the oral cavity, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestines, the large intestines, and how do these things kind of fit together and work together? So that would be an example of systemic anatomy. And you could even look at how these structures relate to other organ systems, but you're looking at kind of broad scales things and the interaction of organs with each other. Regional anatomy is studying the anatomy and meticulous detail of a specific region. So here we're looking at a sagittal section of a human head, a cadaver. A cadaver is a preserved human that we use often for studying, like in medical schools or even in anatomy and physiology classes. And here we're looking at the regional anatomy of the head and neck. Right? So you can study these. I mean, when you start looking closely at any different structure or any region of the body, that anatomy becomes quite complex. It's the reason that you have orthopedic surgeons that are specialists in sh shoulder surgery. Right? It's because, man, when you look at the shoulder really, really closely, dude, it becomes complex, man. So you have specialists, and that would be considered an example of regional anatomy. Whereas surface anatomy is a study of visible landmarks that help you to identify where important things are from a clinical perspective. A term that I often use is palpate. Palpate just means to feel. And when you're looking at this, if you want to palpate the radial pulse, you actually feel for a little bone marking along the radius, which is one of the bones in your forearm that runs on the side of the thumb because it's rad. And you feel, and you can actually feel the blood vessel deep to that. So you're using this marking as an indicator, an identifier, a marker of where certain structures are. And you really, really um, use surface anatomy a lot in medicine, particularly if you get into diagnostic medical imaging imaging like sonography because there are all these different surface features on the body that let you know how you're going to, they orient you to what's going on beneath the surface. So concept check. If a surgeon were going to operate on the heart, he or she would be using a knowledge of what types of anatomy to make the operation a success? I'll give you a minute. Bam! If you answered that, you're good. You're good. And think about why that would be the case. Now, think about the questions that I've asked you that aren't on this. Now, the other subdivision of anatomy is microscopic anatomy, and we can study this at several levels. Cytology, cyte means cell, and ology is the study of. So cytology is the study of cells, and hist means tissue, and ology is the study of. So histology is the study of tissues. Both of these things we need a microscope in order to study in more detail. We can't see these things very well with the unaided eye. So subdivisions of anatomy, cytology, the study and structure of individual cells, so for example, if you were to look at the cells lining the respiratory tract, right, there are cells called goblet cells that secrete mucus. And if you wanted to understand, you know, how the, the anatomy of a goblet cell, you could look at the specific cells. You have ciliated cells that have these cilia on the surface of them. And you could go, well, you have these cilia. Now, what do these cilia do? Why are they there? How are they set up? So cytology is the study of cells, and we use cytology all the time in diagnostics. So think about that question I asked you about the pap smear. Histology is the study and structure of the study of the structure and function of tissues. And histology, right, groups of cells working together to carry out a common set of functions makes up a tissue. So when we're looking at histology, we're looking at groups of cells working together to carry out a common set of functions, and those are tissues, and we're going to look at tissues in a huge amount of detail in a later lecture, but here we're looking at hyaline cartilage connective tissue, and you're looking at these individual little units here, so you have your little cells or your chondrocytes, and there's a bunch of cells, and you want to kind of understand what the relationship they have to one another is, etc. So that's histology. So the study of bone tissue right? It's called histology. 
Now, when you think about anatomy and physiology for something like the exam, I also like to hit you on conceptual questions. So one conceptual question I want you to keep in mind is let's pretend you're an anatomist or a physiologist and you're a car salesman and you're trying to sell me a car. How would you sell a car as an anatomist and how would you sell a car as a physiologist? and then justify why you would answer it that way because half of you may get anatomist, half of you may get physiologist. Think about the distinctions in the way that anatomist and physiologist may think about the world very broadly, very generally at this point. Now, in addition to macroscopic and microscopic, we have um, other subdivisions of anatomy. We have developmental anatomy, pathological anatomy, radiographic anatomy. So if you're looking at, for example, the way that embryos develop, right, from the moment of conception when a sperm fuses to, with an egg to eight weeks in, you have an embryo, right? And how do they develop? How do our major organ systems develop? How do those cells divide and form the liver or the bones or your skeletal muscle tissue? And that's called developmental anatomy. In fact, embryology is a really interesting class. You could also study pediatric anatomy. How do kids grow? How do their bones form? How do tissues form? So you have developmental anatomy. You have pathological anatomy. Pa pathology is the study of disease. Pathology crutches on both anatomy and physiology. Pathological anatomy is just studying how different diseases influence tissues. And if you study how different diseases influence tissues, that becomes an important diagnostic tool. Because if you know what, for example, a uh, blood vessel should look like, and then you characterize a blood vessel as somebody who has arteriosclerotic plaque disease or cholesterol plaques building up all over their blood vessels. You can go, oh, this is what a blood vessel should look like. What does it look like now that the cholesterol deposits have caused these anatomical changes? So you have pathological anatomy. You have radiographic anatomy. We often write... Um, use imaging, specifically radiographs, to observe anatomy in order to make diagnostic decisions. So you have x-rays, sonograms, etc. Now, concept check. Boom! There we go. Concept check. Boom! There we go. So now we have the different fields of anatomy down. Now, we have a basic understanding of anatomy and physiology. We've looked at the different subdivisions of anatomy and physiology, and then we expanded on those subdivisions of anatomy. So we have a basic understanding of what anatomy and physiology is. Now, in order to understand why we study anatomy and physiology the way we do, there's a concept known as levels of organization, which becomes very important. And I always kind of start out the discussion of levels of organization with something that's a bit easier to understand. So... Before we talk about living organisms, let's think about a bike and think about what a bike really is. So this diagram is showing us that a bike is a collection of parts that come together and work together to carry out a complex set of functions, right? Now, living things are very similar to a bicycle in that respect. We are a collection of parts that come together and work together to carry out specific sets of functions. And these parts, you have the individual components that make up the larger structure. In other words, smaller things come together to build up larger, more complex things. So this pedal is just part of this bike. It has its own set of characteristics or properties, but when you throw it together with hundreds of other pieces and you arrange them in a specific way, you get a functioning bicycle. So we're going to look at levels of organization and another thing known or concept known as emergent properties, and we're going to see how they kind of tie together. When we think about levels of organization, the human body is like a bike. We're a collection of parts that come together and work together in order to carry out a set of functions and specifically to maintain homeostasis, except we're much more complex than a bike because we have 200 trillion little building blocks called cells that are all working together, right? So the bike is the simple example. The human body is the more complex example.
But we still follow that same trend of levels of organization. Smaller parts come together to build up larger structures, and as the structures get larger, as parts come together, they become more complex, and they take on new characteristics. So when you look at this uh, little gif right here of Legos, Think about what makes Legos special. It's not the individual little Legos by themselves. Each individual little Lego has its own properties and it's interesting. But Legos become interesting when you start to put them together in different three-dimensional arrangements. And you go, oh, wow, you use these Legos as building blocks and you build a larger, more structurally complex thing that has different characteristics to it. In this case, a little Lego house. And the same is true in biology. In fact, Carl Sagan once said, Carl Sagan, the famous um, astronomer and incredible uh, advocate of science education, once said, the beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. So when you think about our levels of organization, we have the chemical level, the cellular level, the tissue level, the organ system level, the organism level. Now, at the very lowest or least complex on the level of, of organization is the chemical level. And all chemicals are based in an understanding of atoms, right? So atoms are the building blocks of all matter. You can think of atoms as being like little Lego pieces, right? There's a shirt that says you can't tra trust atoms. They make everything up. Everything around you, everything you see, every, right, thing in your house, all the tissues in your body, ultimately they're made up of atoms and atoms form chemicals, right? They, they are the chemical level of organization. When you look at the periodic table of chemi uh, chemical elements, you're looking at, you know, substances formed from atoms. So we have atoms and we're going to study the uh, structure of atoms in meticulous detail later on, but these are really, 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 really small things. You have octillions of them in you. And they're kind of like Lego pieces. They're building blocks. So atoms by themselves have interesting properties, and you can study atoms, and it's a fascinating field if you're like a quantum physicist. As a biologist, I kind of am more concerned with how atoms come together to form larger structures that we refer to as water mo molecules. An example of a molecule could be something like a water molecule, which is made of a hydrogen atom and a hydrogen atom latched onto an oxygen atom. DNA, right? That would be an example of a molecule. Proteins are examples of molecules. Sugars are examples of molecules. And when you throw atoms together, just like with the Lego analogy, right, to form larger, more structurally complex things called molecules, those molecules start to have different properties. They have new characteristics. So an individual hydrogen atom is a little atom floating around, but you throw two hydrogens and an oxygen together, and now you have this molecule that has all of these properties that are so important for life. So our chemical level of organization, we have atoms. Atoms come together to build up molecules. Molecules then come together to build up, at the biology level, little structures within the cell called organelles. So we have complex, what are called eukaryotic cells, which we'll talk about later on, and molecules come together to build up little organelles in the cell. These little organelles are like little functional units in the cell. They're little functional compartments in the cell. So here we're looking at mitochondria, and mitochondria produce energy. Here we're looking at the Golgi apparatus that modifies packages and ships molecules such as proteins around. So you have these molecules, and they come together to make up organelles like mitochondria, nucleus, etc. These organelles then come together to build up the basic, to build or make the basic building blocks of life, which are called cells. Cells are actually quite complex. Just a single cell, I mean, the study of cell biology will boggle your mind the complexity of an individual cell. So you have cells. Cells come together to uh, make up tissues. In fact, a group of cells working together to carry out a common set of functions makes up a tissue. So we have different types of tissues. We have epithelial tissue. We have connective tissue. We have muscle tissue. We have nervous tissue. And each one of those tissues, right, is made up of groupings of cells working together to carry out specific sets of functions. And we look at that in detail. Now, 
Two or more tissues working together to carry out a specific set of functions makes up an organ. So if you look at like the stomach, for example, it's made up of smooth muscle, connective tissue, nervous tissue, epithelial tissue, right? There's all these tissues that go together and kind of latch together in different ways and different ratios to make up the stomach. Now, groups of tissues working together to carry out common sets of functions make up organs. Groups of organs working together to carry out common sets of functions make up organ systems. So, whoa, Mac, what are you doing to me, bro? I'm going to have to plug my Mac in, dude, right now, bro. What's up, bro, Mac? Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And no, I'm not going to edit that out. I'm going to make you listen to me sing. Okay. So groups of organs working together to carry out common sets of functions make up organ systems. So the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, or the digestive system, right, is an organ system. It's made up of like the oral cavity, the esophagus, the stomach, small, large intestines, the liver, gallbladder, pancreas, salivary glands. And they all work together to uh, break down food into its constituent particles, like things, simple sugars and amino acids that can be absorbed and used by the body. That's an organ system. Groups of organ systems working together to carry out a common set of functions makes up an entire organism. So what we're looking at here are young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed students, and they believe anything is possible. But don't worry, life will crush them and their dreams soon enough. So... That's what we're talking about. So think about the question that I've asked you on your handout. Now, an emergent property, emergent properties are those that arise through interactions among smaller parts that alone do not exhibit such properties. In other words, right, a cell by itself, right, even though that cell is a building block of, let's say, the heart or the lungs, they have different sets of characteristics. Small things come together to build larger things, and as these things become larger and more complex, they take on a unique set of properties or characteristics. So let's think about that statement in more detail, this idea of an emergent property. Let's pretend we were putting together a basketball team. And you would think that the best way to put together a basketball team was to get the best players. So I get LeBron James, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, uh, and um, Kyrie Irving. I don't know. And we put them together, but and we get the sum of those actions of each of the individual parts. But let's say that they don't perform very well, right? Let's say that they, even though you took the best individual parts, that when you put them together, that team isn't necessarily that good because LeBron and Kyrie are fighting all the time, right? The all-star team isn't necessarily the best team. Now, let's say you get a group of average players and you put them together, but they work together really well. And as a consequence of that, they beat this team. That's called an emergent property. You wouldn't be able to predict by any one of those players by themselves that when they were put together, right, they'd be able to beat this all-star team because the whole is greater than the sum of their parts. The team is greater than the individual players. So the fact that they worked well together as a team had the emergent property of them being a better team than the team comprised of all of all-stars. And you wouldn't know that until you put those players together and watch them interact. So the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. A team is greater than its individual players. And you don't know how they're going to respond when they, you put them together until you put them together. Well, biology is the same. You have individual parts, for example, let's say DNA molecules, proteins, etc., that come together to make up cells. When these individual parts come together and work together, they take on a completely different set of characteristics, right? And now you have life, emergent properties result. You know, an individual protein can't regulate the inside independently from its outside, but a cell can. An individual protein can't burn sugar for energy, but a cell can, right? Right? 
The whole, the team working together, all these little individual parts in the cell is greater than the sum of the individual parts. And you got to kind of look at how they work together. So you can learn a lot by looking at those individual parts, but you don't get the whole story until you look at how those individual parts interact with one another. And that's what an emergent property is. They're characteristics of a larger, more complex structure that aren't shared by its less complex counterpart. So when you think about emergent properties of multicellular organisms, let's say we had one individual cardiac muscle cell. Well, it can do some really interesting things, but when you throw it with a bunch of other cardiac muscle cells to form cardiac muscle tissue, now you have a tissue that's capable of cells are capable of communicating with one another. Individual cell can communicate just uh, with, with another cell. It needs more cells for one cell to communicate with another cell. That's an emergent property. Cells communicating one, with one another is an emergent property of a tissue comparative to a cell by itself. Right? And now you get this tissue, and this tissue is capable of contracting. When you throw this tissue together in a specific three-dimensional arrangement, you form the heart. And now the heart is capable of contracting in a very specific way that allows you to pump blood through the body. The heart combined with other organs, like blood vessels, makes up your cardiovascular system. And now you can pump blood through the body in order to deliver things like nutrients and oxygen. The cardiovascular system, working with all your other systems, right, makes up you as a human being. And now you have some very, very complex functions functional capabilities like you can sing, breathe, etc. All of those are emergent properties. Humans make up populations, populations make up ecosystems, ecosystems make up uh, biospheres, biospheres make up the planet, the planet is part of the solar system. Small things come together to build larger things, and we use that all the time. And people who study different fields study different spatial scales or different levels of organization. So, for example, molecular biologists care a lot about what's happening at the cell and molecular level. They go, well, how is this protein working, and how does that contribute to the overall function of the cell? Whereas, let's say, a systems physiologist may be more interested in the heart and uh, the muscle, you know, muscle deposition in the heart in response to uh, disease states, whatever it is, right? And we look at these different spatial scales, and they all kind of link to one another. So a review of levels of organization. Make sure you can answer a question like this, especially for something like the assessment test. Give it a go. Baby damn! So now, we're in the chapter, chapter 1 lecture block. What are we going to be studying? Well, today's lecture was the introduction, but you would have gotten all of this material had you been in a traditional class setting, right? So we've gone over the introduction. This is the instructor video on homeostasis, or pardon me, this is the introduction video. The next video we're going to be going over is my video on homeostasis. Then we're going to have another instructor's video over medical terminology. I always give credit when I use other instructor's videos. And then we're going to have two videos over the language of anatomy and physiology. All of this falls into your lecture one block. Have a good day. Bye-bye.